come before you and we bow our hearts and our lives before you. We thank you that we have so sure of a word from you that we can, that we are able to uh, trust your word. Uh, that we are able to trust you and trust in you and believe in you. To everything that uh, life throws at us, uh, for all the uh, ups and downs, um, moments of discouragement, moments of elation, uh, whether rejoicing or sorrow, your word is true. And it is you through your Holy Spirit and your word that sustains us, and we thank you. And so glorify your name, O Lord, in each of our lives and in the life of the church. And we thank you for the church, Lord, and we pray that you would continue to build us up in faith and love and hope, and that we would be a vessel through which you are honored and your people give thanks. Lord, we think of our missionaries and our missionary of the week, Elizabeth Biggie, and we pray that you would be with her um, in the mission you have given her, uh, being able to be in contact with those who uh, need to hear the word of truth, developing uh, not just contacts, but a familiarity, but not just a familiarity. Uh, but a friendship, and that through this process, uh, there are those who come to confess Jesus as Messiah, and we, we ask, Lord, that you would bless her ministry to that end, and that much fruit, O oh Lord, would be born. Lord, we lift up our nation to you, and we pray for its welfare and for peace. Uh, we pray, Lord, that also you would guide those in authority over us, granting wisdom and discernment and understanding. Lord, you know also our needs here uh, in this church. There are those struggling with health issues. Uh, we lift up uh, Jim to you who will has a doctor's appointment this Wednesday, and we pray uh, for your hand a blessing upon that time, uh, that if there is something going on, it can be found and corrected. Uh, for Dan and Cindy, who will be traveling back on Tuesday, grant them safety. For Franklin, Sando, and their family who are going to Africa on Tuesday, we pray for your blessing upon them. And we pray, Lord, that you would be with them and grant them safety and travel there and back. Uh, Lord, for other needs there are for Keith and his shoulder and rehabilitation, for Grace, little Grace, and her recovery from surgery and, and so on. Uh, for others, Lord, that uh, are dealing with things, may they know your presence, your mercy and grace and loving kindness. And may each one of us, Lord, uh, know these things in our lives as you sustain us and as you keep us, O oh Lord, in your care. And now as we turn to your word, we pray that you would uh, be pleased to speak to our hearts, encourage us, building us up in the faith, strengthening, strengthening us in the inner man, that we might be vessels fit for your use and glory. And we pray all of this in the wonderful name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22, verses 15 through 24. We're going to go ahead and read those together. 
This is our last uh, visit to this chapter. And, and I trust that you would be able to take some of this information, some of the things that we have discussed, and turn it into a private uh, Bible study as well, because I think chapter 22, well, the whole thing, but chapter 22 is uh, uh, very important in redemptive history. Starting at verse 15, we'll read down through verse 24. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies." In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. Now it came about after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor, Boz his firstborn, and Boz his brother, and Kemuel, the father of Aram and Kesed, and Hatzo, and Pildash, and Jidlaf, and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. His concubine, whose name was Reumah, also bore Teba, and Gaham, and Tehash, and Maakah. And may the Lord bless his word to our lives. Who is the God of Abraham? Who is this God of Abraham? Who is this God that told Abraham in Genesis 22, verse 2, to take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. At this point in time, Abraham had walked with God about 35 or 40 years. Imagine that. Also, it had been about 5 to 10 years since God had spoken to Abraham in any way. We, again, we tend to think that it's constant, but it isn't. Abraham knew that when God did speak, it was something very important. We know that when God spoke, he was advancing something about himself and his relationship, we could add, and his ways with Abraham. Every step of the way, God showed him a little more concerning the promise given to him, amplifying it, restating it, and so on. Every step of the way, the Lord had showed himself faithful to Abraham. The Lord had promised to bless Abraham, and he certainly did. He promised also to make Abraham's name great, and he did. The Lord also promised that Abraham would be a blessing, and so he was. The Lord also promised to protect Abraham by blessing those who bless him and cursing those who curse him, and so he did. There are two things I left out concerning the promise of God given to Abraham at the beginning. The first is that God said he would make him a great nation. The second was that he promised that in him, that is in his seed, all the families of the earth would be blessed. You see, here is where the tension was built. Everything God had promised Abraham hinged on the birth of his son, Isaac. There is no nation apart from Isaac and his own fruitfulness. And there is no blessing all the families of the earth without Isaac. 
Even so, God brought Abraham to the point of asking him to sacrifice his own son. We saw that Abraham obeyed. It is worth noting again that it is because of the nature, that is, it is because of the very nature of the promise of God given to Abraham that he asked him to do this. Let's ask the question again. Who is this God that told Abraham to sacrifice his own son? He is the God who created all things by his powerful word. He is the one who sustains all things by that same word. He is the living and true God. He is the one with whom we have to do. He is the judge of all the earth. As judge, he judges righteously, and it's spelled out in his word. He is just in his dealings with humanity. He is the one who sets forth his promise to deal with the rebellion of humanity. He is the one who is compassionate, merciful, gracious, patient, abounding in loving kindness and truth. He forgives our sin, iniquity, and transgression. He is the one who reveals himself so that we might know him and know his ways. He is faithful to himself, and that's very important. We're not always faithful to our word. We're not always faithful to, to ourselves, to what we say we believe. But he is always faithful to himself and to his word of promise. He is God Almighty. He is the one we look up to for help, up to the mountains. From whence shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord. He is God Most High. There is no one greater in any aspect of wisdom or discernment or understanding. There is no one greater or more ultimate, period. He is the one who makes his ways known unto the sons of men. I suspect that Abraham knew the Lord better than anyone else at this point in redemptive history. He trusted in the Lord. This is what carried him through the ups and downs of life in Canaan. So when God commands him to sacrifice his son that he loves... He gets up first thing in the morning and makes preparations, and he sets off to the land of Moriah, to the mountain that God would show to him. It is why Abraham could say two amazing things before he got there. The lad and I will go worship and will come back to you. God will himself provide the lamb for the offering in his answer to Isaac. Somehow, some way, what God had promised will not be undone by what he now commands. Abraham knew this of God. We need to learn these things of God. We looked at what happened last time. Abraham had everything prepared. He bound his son and placed him on the wood on the altar. He reached for his knife, and that is when the angel of the Lord stopped him. And as he looked around, he saw the ram caught in the thicket. Indeed, Abraham and Isaac worshipped the Lord there together. With the ram as a burnt offering in place of his only son that he loved, Abraham demonstrated great faith. Abraham demonstrated a proper fear of God to which very few attain. He feared God more than understanding how this promise would be fulfilled if he sacrificed his son. He believed the Creator could restore his son to him. He trusted in the Lord, in his character, in his word of promise. But we're not finished. You may have thought, we're done now time for the next scene, but not quite. 
So we have the promise solidified. Coming to the end of the last section, one would be tempted to think that this is the end of it. After all, Abraham did everything that the Lord had asked of him. And it was the angel of the Lord himself who stopped him from following through with it. In fact, the Lord provided a substitute for Isaac, and presumably Abraham and Isaac worshipped the Lord together in sacrificing the ram as a burnt offering. And so the Lord had indeed provided the lamb for the offering, as Isaac had asked. And Abraham and Isaac would return from worship to the young men waiting for them. But that was not the end of it. They concluded at the end of that time together, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. We continue reading in the text that the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven. We do make the assumption that Abraham and Isaac followed through with worship and had concluded their time together before the angel spoke. So a period of time had passed while the ram was then bound and put on the wood of the altar and sacrificed and consumed by the fire and so forth. And then the angel says in 22, 16, and 17, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemy. The first thing I want you to notice is the first phrase which emphasizes the Lord swearing by himself. The angel of the Lord is definitively identified as the living and true God. <clears throat> God most high whom Abraham served. In this act of swearing the Lord establishes himself if there was ever a doubt that he alone is ultimate. He alone is supreme. It is important for the creature, you and I, to swear by one greater than itself. But for the Creator, being ultimate, being supreme, there is no one greater. So he must swear by himself. It used to be that when you testified at a trial, you were to swear on a Bible, right? And you swore to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Someone greater is sworn to with the attendant blessing and curse that went with it. Now, well, it's optional. You can just affirm instead of swearing. It's really the same thing, but people tend to think affirming is different you're still needing to tell the truth, right? You can ignore God, supposedly, but in the act of swearing you are, or even affirming, you are actually acknowledging his existence. So you can ignore God in the affirmation or swearing. When you do affirm or swear in a secular setting, there is still an acknowledgement of something greater than oneself, and it's not the state. There is something greater, something intangible. But not only that, there is an acknowledgement that one will be held to an account if false information is provided. They don't say, when you're up on the stand, oh, it's okay if you lie. Not at all. Not at all. As we said, there is no one greater than God. So to whom else would he swear except himself? By myself I have sworn. It never ceases to amaze me then how the secular world has to borrow from the Christian worldview in order to function in God's world. They know, sitting there on the stand in the courtroom, that truth must be told. And an affirmation or swearing to that effect has to take place. 
God is supreme. God is ultimate. There is no one greater in one's appeal. It is to the Lord God most high. Secondly, the Lord acknowledges Abraham's sacrifice. He did not withhold his only son. The very person upon which the promise of God hinged was to be sacrificed. Abraham knew that he and his son would be back to the young men after worshiping. And he also knew that God would provide the lamb for the sacrifice. That was his statement of faith. But he also considered, as we saw in Hebrews, that God was able to raise his son again. Would you have followed through with it? Thinking, well, God can raise him from the dead. That's a tough one. Now, the phraseology, only son, might have an objection if it were not for the fact that this was his only son by Sarah. Remember, there was Ishmael. But this is his only son by Sarah, in terms of whom the promise resided. The echoes of that, of uh, the phraseology that God uses, should sound familiar, right? Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, and it should remind you of Christ, God's son, his only son, whom he loved. But the point here is that he feared God more than losing the promise itself. You see, that was the point. Am I going to trust in what God says? Thirdly, because Abraham did this thing and did not withhold his son, the Lord says that he will greatly bless him and greatly multiply his seed as the stars of the heavens, among other things. What is explicitly left out, although I think is implied, is that Abraham will be made into a great nation. The point isn't that God is going to renege on part of his promise, that he spoke to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, but that the Lord is emphasizing certain aspects of that promise. He is advancing it in the life of Abraham so that it might be better understood, this crucial aspect of it. It must be clearly understood here that there is a multiplying effect in the life of Abraham then. So we need to think generationally as well. Not only will there be a physical multiplying effect, but there will be a multiplying effect for the promise of God. Remember, God's promise is to Abraham and to his seed, which was signified by circumcision earlier on. Abraham's seed, of course, will be consolidated into a nation. This nation will be the conduit of the seed which will come, and in whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. More on that in a moment. Fourthly, Abraham's seed shall possess the gate of their, or literally his, enemies. Let's take the easier part first. To possess the gate of one's enemies is to control the power center. That's where the leaders sat at the gate. We learned previously that the gate is where those in authority sat and dealt with the issues concerning the city to which people entered. It was there that people were funneled to participate in commerce or to find temporary shelter as one traveled on to another place. But the important thing to remember here is the issue of authority. It is important for us also to remember the conflict between the seed lines. We have the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Abraham's seed is to be thought of as in line with the seed of the woman who has now produced. Initially she did not, now she has. His seed will possess the gate of their enemies, which means Abraham's seed will overcome their enemies. Now let's tackle the more difficult part of this phrase. Will Abraham's seed possess the gate of their enemies? 
This is what God promises to Abraham. So if he promises it, will it come to pass? Yes, it will come to pass. The question is, how will it come to pass? What will it look like? That is, in what way will it come to pass? And in order for us to answer these questions, we need to remember our cues from earlier. We acknowledge the two seed lines, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, and that God places enmity between the lines. The promise in Genesis 3.15 is to destroy the works of the serpent. I believe that this statement to Abraham addresses that very thing, which is to say that the seed of the woman, singular, the one in whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed, will destroy the serpent and his works. Now what about the people of God, the group of people, Israel, the church? Well, they will join in the victory that the seed of the woman secures. We walk in victory. We walk in the victory of Christ. Being in common cause with the seed of the woman brings victory to the people of God. Victory is not achieved in any strength or wisdom of humanity. Victory is achieved in the sacrifice of the seed of the woman. In that way, the gate to the enemy will be possessed or overcome. Fifthly, the blessing of God will come to all the nations or families of the earth. I want you to notice the phrases that encapsulates this section of Scripture in Genesis 22, 15 through 18. It is bracketed with, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, with because you have obeyed my voice. Let that sink in. The faithfulness of Abraham must not be underestimated. The Lord God faithfully carried Abraham throughout his sojourn in the land of Canaan. He trained him in righteousness and helped him develop discernment concerning good and evil. In the end, Abraham has demonstrated a greater fear of God than a complete understanding of how his promise would come to fruition. If Isaac was sacrificed, a comparison study would be well worth your time in comparing the, how Abraham feared God as compared to Adam and Eve, the people of the generation before the great flood, the people of the generation after the great flood, and so forth on through Scripture. We have learned previously that humanity is in no position to secure for itself the blessing of God. No position whatsoever. Here in no uncertain terms, God is providing the means of salvation or deliverance for humanity. Indeed, the way out is through the seed of the woman who overcomes the seed of the serpent and thus brings into view the blessings of God upon all the nations which had previously, remember, at Babel, all gone their own way. God's grace surely abounds then where sin abounds. We need to remember that as well. Our God will accomplish all his gracious and mer merciful purposes in the seed of the woman and the seed of Abraham. Now we come to the providential provision. After the angel of the Lord had spoken to Abraham, he returned to his young men as he said he would do. And the whole clan is now living in Beersheba. And then we have this section of scripture put in almost like a footnote, right? We're told of Nahor's children being born to him by Milcah. The children born to Nahor and Milcah are Uz, Buzz, Kemuel, Kesed, Hatso, Pildash, Jidlath, and Bethuel. I didn't add the other names in. Saying them once was good enough. However, the other pertinent piece of information is that Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. Rebekah. 
So I have labeled this small genealogy providential provision for a specific reason. Every genealogy listed in the scriptures is there to show us the connections or continuity from the past on into the present. They are there to show us how the promise of God either progresses or is stymied, but only temporarily, or appearing to be stymied. Here, with Abraham's test coming to a conclusion, we are left with one glaring absence. Do you know what it is? Huh? No, not Ishmael. He's, he's captured later on, but... Not Ishmael. Where will Abraham find a wife for his son Isaac? From the people of the land of Canaan who are cursed, remember Noah? Cursed be Canaan. The Lord opens the door here for us to see that at a future time Isaac will indeed have a wife. However, like in other instances, we know the outcome of this. We know the outcome. But Abraham had only heard about his brother's extended family. As we wrap up our thoughts for today, this really is the apex of Abraham's relationship with a living and true God. Moses begins this section of Scripture with the words, if you remember, Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. This was a test like no other. The Lord will never test you in this same way. So if you have a vision of or a dream where uh, someone who pretends to be in authority says, go sacrifice your son or your daughter, don't listen. Don't listen. You will never, ever be tested in this way. However, you will be tested. I, I wish I could tell you different, but I, it's not the case. So I don't want to be misunderstood here. And the testing that you will endure may reach to the very core of your being. It will challenge you. And the various tests that you encounter will all hinge on the same thing I'm convinced of. Do you fear God and love Him above all else? Do you fear God and love Him above all else? That's a challenge. Because like Peter, you might say boldly, well, of course I'd never deny you. And then you're in the pressure cooker. The flame is high. And you're thinking, so the question is, do you fear God and love Him above all else? You see, that's what it always comes down to. In any temptation, any test, any event in life, do you love Him the most? Every test and every temptation, for that matter, reveals in the moment your ultimate commitment. Right? You'll say, I am committed to the Lord of glory. He is God most high. And in the heat of it, where will you turn? To God most high or to something else? It will be revealed in that moment whom you fear more, whom you love more, either to the living and true God or to something or someone else. Maybe your own protection, because you think you can protect yourself better than God can, or prevent as much pain coming into your life as God can. Here it is revealed that Abraham loves God and fears Him more than anything or anyone else. Remember, the unbeliever scoffs at this passage. He belittles God. He says, you believe in such a God as this? Now you have some ammunition to take with you. For you it may be that you will be tested concerning your love for God and whether you will fear Him more than understanding how a particular circumstance will turn out. 
We know how Abraham responded now. How will you respond? And through it all, will you cling, you see, will you cling to the promise that in Abraham's seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed? Will you cling to the promise of God? We sang about it. We said we would in the song. And now will we really do it? Father in heaven, thank you for your word and what it means to us. Your word is life. We echo the words of of Peter. We say, Lord, your words are life. To whom else shall we go? And that is so true. Lord, I know that we make, uh, well, we commit sin. We make missteps in a moment, in a heated moment maybe of testing. We decide we need to fear or love something more than you. And so we're grateful for your grace that abounds where sin abounds. But we don't want to use it as license, Lord. So we pray that you would continue, like in Abraham's life, to teach us your ways, that we may walk in your truth, that we truly may be vessels fit for your use and glory, vessels that seek your glory over all things, your honor over all things. And so we give you the praise and the glory and the honor through and with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.